Hello everyone! This is a video about European history, and also about one or two tactics that fascists use in order to mis- Uh, first thing I want to say, he says European history is not white history. It's a very interesting clickbaity title. I think 99% of people assume that European and white are kind of kind of mean the same thing, so it'll be interesting to see where he goes with this represent it. Uh, for examples of such misrepresentation, we'll be looking at a video by Mark Collett entitled Writing Europeans Out of Their Own History, currently with over 400,000 views. Now, unfortunately, I have to make a brief diversion here at the start of the video in order to prove to you that this video was actually made by a fascist. You know, I kind of need you on board with that. Why does it matter? He's going to spend the next few minutes like basically pointing out this guy, oh, he's a fascist, he's a Nazi, he's a white supremacist. And uh, I guess my thing is that just feels like kind of an ad hominem attack. You know, it has nothing to do with the arguments he's making, that you can call him these sort of mean words, you know. And I know Sean's audience, uh, especially most people actually, they have kind of a knee-jerk reaction to these terms like fascist and Nazi, so... By like accusing Mark of being that he's hurting his credibility in their eyes, but really, does it matter? Does it really matter if he's a fascist or not? I don't think so. Idea if we're going to be talking about fascist tactics, don't I? So, okay, who is Mark Collett? He's the former leader of the youth division of the far-right BNP, the British National Party. Now, the BNP has roots in far more open and undisguised fascism, but after Nick Griffin became leader of the party in 1999, they began using more moderate and ambiguous language, disguising their real aims and beliefs behind euphemisms. Uh, helpfully for us, Griffin gave a speech to a group called the American Friends of the BMP in the year 2000, alongside former Grand Wizard of the KKK, David Duke. See, there he goes again, throwing out this word KKK. Who? David Duke was in the Ku Klux Klan like fucking 50 years ago. Who, who cares? It, it, it has nothing to do with the content of this video. It's just an ad hominem attack. By the way, in which he lays out the thinking behind this change in tactics. Let's have a listen. There's a difference between selling out your ideas and selling your ideas. And the British National Party isn't about selling out its ideas, which are your ideas too, but we are determined now to sell them. And that means basically to use these saleable words, as I say, freedom, security, identity, democracy. Nobody can criticize them. Nobody can come at you and attack you on those ideas. They are saleable. Perhaps one day, once by being rather more subtle, we've got ourselves in a position where we control the British broadcasting media, then perhaps one day the British people might change their mind and say, yes, every last one must go. Perhaps they will one day. But if you hold it out as your sole aim to start with, you're going to get absolutely nowhere. So, instead of talking about racial purity, you talk about identity. So, that's fairly unambiguous. Well, there's nothing wrong with uh, good marketing. Everyone does it there, isn't it? We want to talk about racial purity, but we know it isn't a goer, so we talk about identity and freedom and democracy and so on. It's a fairly common tactic of various far-right groups. Now, two years after this speech... Okay, I'm not going to disagree with that. I just, I don't think it matters. Mark Collett was featured in a Channel 4 documentary called Young, Nazi, and Proud, during which he was secretly... This is more name-calling, oh, you're a Nazi. Who cares, dude? Who cares? Germany. The documentary also includes footage of him being told he was secretly recorded, which is hilarious, and I would highly encourage you to give it a watch. Also at one point, Collett claims he isn't a Nazi because there's no Nazi symbols around his house, you know, as if it was owning a swastika flag that made one a Nazi. I mean, it kind of... Nazi means the National Socialism, and it means, you know, the specific party that existed in Germany... Uh, 20 in the 20s and 30s you know and he, he is a white nationalist i'll agree with that but what people like sean want to do is they want to conflate white nationalism with nazism because nazis have such a 
bad reputation. And, you know, it's whatever. I mean, of course, they're going to do that. And if, if your definition of Nazi is just a white nationalist, then sure, he's a Nazi. But if your definition of Nazi is the historical one, then, you know, technically he's not. And he's not really being inaccurate when he says that. Nazi instead of sharing political beliefs with the Nazis. Either way, here's a picture of Mark Collett with his girlfriend, who has a swastika tattooed on her chest. Oh god, a swastika. So then, Mark Collett is a fascist. And, my apologies, I realise it's rather inelegant of me to just dump all of that on you at the start there. I usually try to be a bit more subtle about it, you know, but I feel it is important that as we go through the arguments in the video, we realise that what we're seeing is fascism trying to be saleable as Nick Griffin put it. I would still encourage you to watch his video first, so you can be sure I'm not misrepresenting his arguments, although it is fairly quick to summarise, so I will do so here. So Mark's argument goes like this. There exists a nefarious plot to write Europeans out of their own history, a nefarious plot that has found itself enacted in the following ways. Uh, casting a mixed-race woman to play Joan of Arc at a festival, a BBC cartoon about life in Roman Britain that showed a black Roman soldier. Uh, the Hollow Crown, a series of TV adaptations of Shakespeare plays, cast a black actor to play Queen Margaret. Doctor Who cast a black actor to portray a Victorian soldier, and elsewhere shows black Victorians on the streets of London. ABC cast a black actor to play Sir Lancelot in their show Once Upon a Time. And various other places cast black actors to play things, you get the point. Now, Mark compares this to both whitewashing and cultural appropriation, pointing out the supposed contradiction that some people complain about white actors taking roles from minority actors, but they don't complain about the reverse. Mark then concludes that all this is a deliberate cultural Marxist plot to undermine Western civilization by eroding our common bonds histories. I mean, is it? Is it not deliberate? Is this just accidentally happening? Did they not specifically plan to cast these people in these roles for specific reasons? I think that would be hard to deny. Homogeneity and so on. Writing people out of their own history will atomize that people and weaken their in-group preference, so he says. And we need to come together and defend Europe by becoming fascists. Well, he doesn't actually say that last part, but, you know, he may as well. So what do we think about this video? Well, it is riddled with historical inaccuracies for a start. Before we get to the arguments here, I'm going to have to get my red pen out and do a little correcting. Let's start with that BBC cartoon showing a black Roman soldier. So this was a video put out on the BBC Teach channel that currently has about 50,000 views, about 6,000 of which appear to have only turned up to give it a downvote, though. Uh, so then, black Roman soldiers in Britain, were they a thing? Well, we'll find out shortly. First of all, as Mark Collett shows this image in his video, he says this sentence. At every turn, the BBC attempted to shoehorn someone who was not indigenous to the British Isles into the production. Now Mark, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but this cartoon was about life after the Roman invasion of Britain. The Romans weren't indigenous, they invaded and took it over. You know, you should probably actually watch the cartoons and <laughs> maybe learn something, you know. Uh, why do you think Britain is called Britain, even? That's just some homework for you there. Anyway, yes, the Roman Empire spanned from the UK to Africa to the Middle East, and it recruited people into the legions from all over the place. And the Romans would use legions from one part of the empire to guard other parts of the empire. It's a lot easier to say things like, go and put down that rebellion, if you're not ordering men to go and fight their brothers and fathers and cousins and so on. I'm going to read a little here from the Historia Augusta, speaking about the life of Emperor Septimius Severus. And I quote, On another occasion, when he was returning to his nearest quarters from an inspection of the wall at Luguvalum in Britain, at a time when he had not only proved victorious but had concluded a perpetual peace, just as he was wondering what omen would present itself, an Ethiopian soldier who was famous among buffoons and always a notable jester met him with a garland of cypress boughs. 
And when Severus, in a rage, ordered that the man be removed from his sight, troubled as he was by the man's ominous colour and the ominous nature of the garland, the Ethiopian, by way of jest, cried, It is said, You have been all things, you have conquered all things, now, O conqueror, be a god. Uh, Lugu Valum there being the name of a... F okay, so he's being a little bit disingenuous here. He found one reference to a African soldier that doesn't mean that there were so many Africans in Britain uh, to the extent that this BBC cartoon is clearly trying to portray and I think it is clear to most people which is why the dislike ratio for that video was so large that the BBC was not doing this for historical reasons they were doing this for political correctness reasons and they were overemphasizing you know maybe there were a handful of black soldiers in Britain from the cartoon you would get the impression they were 20 30 percent of the population you know that's not even close to true and Sean just kind of ignores this and he well let's continue watching the video fought along Hadrian's wall so there we go Historia Augusta black soldier manning Hadrian's wall yeah and the emperor in that story, Septimius Severus, was himself from North Africa, born in what is modern-day Libya. Uh, his wife was Syrian. And this is a surviving image of the... This is another bit of uh, disingenuity. It's... Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that's a word. Um, you know, people from North Africa are not exactly what you would consider black and... You know that the, in the BBC cartoon that he's talking about right now, they were they didn't look North African, and you can't just say, "Oh, the continent of Africa, everybody from there is the same," because, well, you know what I'm saying. The imperial family from the time. The real historical revisionism here is pretending that the Roman Empire was exclusively white and also somehow homogenous with other apparently exclusively white societies that it was in the process of invading and conquering. I don't think he's saying the Roman Empire was exclusively white. I think he was saying that Britain at the time was probably like 99.9% .9 white. Maybe there was a few, like, like I said, a handful of non-whites there, but not even close to the extent that... Uh, the BBC cartoon is trying to portray, and, you know, I don't think Sean ever addresses that in this video. I don't think he ever provides evidence that there's actually, like, a statistically significant number of non-whites in Britain at the time. So just keep that in mind while he makes these points. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. So, were there black Romans? Yes, there were. Uh, next up, let's talk about that Doctor Who episode that showed a black Victorian soldier. Now, it's quite interesting, this. As we can see from doing a little research about it, uh, Mark Gattis, one of the writers of Doctor Who, initially protested against the casting. And quoting from the Telegraph here, it was only after he discovered records showing that there was in fact a single black soldier in Victoria's army that he accepted the decision. Gattis told how he'd decided to research the issue and came across the story of Jimmy Durham, a Sudanese boy who was rescued from the River Nile in 1886 and brought up by soldiers of the Durham Light Infantry Regiment. However, whether or not there is actual historical precedent for portraying a black Victorian soldier isn't really the most pressing issue here if we're aiming for historical accuracy because the episode of Doctor Who that features the character of the black Victorian soldier has him fighting a war against a race of reptilian men called the Ice Warriors on Mars. So much for historical accuracy, eh? We all remember, don't we, when Queen Victoria sent a detachment of troops to Mars to fight the Ice Okay, this is, again, disingenuous. So there was one black soldier that he found out about, and that doesn't equal you know giving a significant amount of representation to a black soldier in a historical film um also it's you know you it's we can 
distinguish different motives for different parts of the story uh, here. So, you know, fighting reptilians is clearly just that. It's, there's no political agenda behind that, obviously. It's just there to add kind of an entertaining aspect to the to the show. But adding the black person there is clearly an attempt to promote multiculturalism as a political uh, agenda. Um, so, you know, and that's, I think that's the obvious difference that most people can see. And I just think Sean is being incredibly disingenuous here that he's not even addressing that. Ice warriors. What a betrayal of their memory to pretend it wasn't exclusively white men who lost their lives in the Martian Icemen Wars, you know, writing Europeans out of their own history, honestly. Now a similar point can be made for that depiction of a black Lancelot in the show Once Upon a Time, which appears to be some sort of Shrek-esque, what if all the fairy tales but at once type story. For example, the show also includes Anna and Elsa from Frozen, Ariel from The Little Mermaid, Cruella de Vil, that's such a good name. Cruella. Same thing here. There's a difference. You know, these guys are here for entertainment purposes. The black guy is there for a political purpose. Mark recognizes that. I think Sean recognizes that too, but he won't admit it, and he's being disingenuous here. Deville. It's amazing. Uh, so this is hardly a historical documentary, is it? You know, and Lancelot wasn't real. Remember, he's a fictional character. Regardless, is there precedent for a black Arthurian knight? Uh, yes, as it turns out, uh, Morian is the Moorish son of Sir Aglovale, one of the Knights of the Round Table, and the 13th century story he appears in describes him as black of face and limb, and also says that his teeth were white as chalk, otherwise he was altogether black, he bared his head, which was black as pitch, that was the fashion of his land, moors are black as burnt brands, he was all black, even as I tell you. Okay, again, you can find one individual black soldier. You can find edge cases throughout history. It doesn't change the fact that Britain at the time was probably like 99.99999% uh, white. And it doesn't change the fact that the people behind this uh, production are clear, clearly made the black guy a significant role in the feature for political reasons. His head, his body, and his hands were all black, saving only his teeth, and so on. So you get it. This guy was black. So it turns out even the round table wasn't exclusively white. And there was also Palamedia. Sorry to keep pausing this video, but this is a really, this is a straw man. Nobody said it was exclusively white, as in there was literally zero non-white people. It's just that there was so few of them that it it doesn't really make sense to talk about them unless you have some kind of political motive that you're trying to push. These who was a Saracen who converted to Christianity, and if we're talking about historical accuracy, there was also the Green Knight, whose skin and hair and horse even for some reason, was green, and who, by the way, survives having his own head cut off. Same thing here. Sean is not able to distinguish between stuff that is for entertainment purposes and stuff that is for political purposes. So, you know. Uh, returning to Doctor Who for a moment, and that scene featuring the black Victorians on the street. So is this a malicious plot to undermine Western civilization or whatever? Well, let me reveal one of my tricks of the trade to you right here. Uh, what I do when I want to find out about stuff, for example, if there's any pictures of black Victorians, is head over to Google and type in black Victorians and do an image search, and lo and behold, there are. Now, I'm saying Victorians here, uh, but that's not really accurate to the Doctor Who clip, which is set in Regency England. You see, Mark Collett says the Doctor is walking through... This is, this is anecdotal evidence. What is the percentage of black victorians and what is the percentage of uh, black victorians that are portrayed in this uh in this uh doctor who feature that's the real that's the real question here you can always find edge cases but if you look at the big picture you know 
it's obvious that somebody is trying to push a political agenda here. For a quote, Regency England in Victorian times, uh, which doesn't really make sense. Uh, the episode's set in 1814, and Victoria wasn't even born for another five years, but whatever. Minor mistake. Uh, the important thing here is the year, 1814. So then, who are these three people? Well, they are some prominent black abolitionists in England who were active prior to the date that that Doctor Who episode is set. I'll put some links below in the description so you can have a read about them. I mention those black abolitionists here because England participated in, not sure if you've ever heard of it, uh, the slave trade, one consequence of which was that many black people were moved around all over the place. How many black people? You can say many black people, but what is the percentage? How many? without a choice, and after the buying and selling of slaves was abolished across the British Empire, those black people didn't disappear. Anyway, next up, let's talk about Sophie Okanedo playing Queen Margaret in that television adaptation of Shakespeare. Now, the important point here is that she is not playing Margaret, the historical figure. She is playing Margaret, the Shakespeare character. This is a theatrical practice that's been translated to television along with the rest of the material. Uh, speaking to The Express, director Dominic Cook said, Well, in the theatre we've been doing it this way for donkey's years. He said he wanted to go with the actor who was right for the part, rather than any other factor. Now, something I could point out here is, for instance, Laurence Olivier playing a fellow in blackface, and I could note that I don't see Mark Collett complaining about that. Uh, but that would be rather lazy of me. You see, what I'd be doing there would be making the same point as Mark Collett makes with his whitewashing contradiction, just in the other direction. You see, Mark makes mention of both whitewashing and cultural appropriation debates to highlight how the supposed cultural Marxists always complain when a white person appropriates something or takes an acting role from a minority actor, but they don't complain about the reverse. Now, what Mark doesn't mention here is that he also participates in this apparent hypocrisy, because he is complaining about black actors being cast in things, while at the same time not condemning whitewashing or cultural appropriation, which he should, by all accounts, be equally outraged about if he were coming at this from a position of neutrality. I don't think that's how this works. He's pointing out that you have a certain value, and he's pointing out that you are being hypocritical about it. That doesn't necessarily make it his value. Okay. Uh, but just pointing that out wouldn't be good enough, I don't think, from me. That would just be me saying, hey, Mark, that thing you're complaining about, well, you do it too. Nah. You know, what I really need to do is explain why minority actors being cast in quotes white roles isn't as bad as the reverse. And it's for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first being a rather simple one. There are typically more roles to go around for white actors. I don't... You know, ScarJo playing a Japanese character in a live-action adaptation of a Japanese story is bad so, part. There's more roles for white actors in European societies, but in uh, non-European societies, it's the reverse. I, I don't, I don't see his point here. Actually, because there are so few lead roles in Hollywood for well, Asian. Well, Hollywood is in a uh, is a European is in a European country. Why? There's nothing stopping. African countries and Asian countries and uh, South American countries from having their own movies. And actors. It's not like there's equal representation there at all. Why uh, does on it the need other to be? This is our majority white countries. There should be majority white films. And the reverse, an Asian actor being cast in a role you might typically assume would be played by a white actor, that brings us closer to equal representation. So that's equal why people representation are representation in white countries. What about in Asian countries? You know, if you want to talk about a uh, global, white people are a minority. On the left, anyway, tend to care more about one instance than the other. There. Now, to be fair here, I can see instances where a director would cast someone in a role for a cynical rather than purely altruistic reason. So, why would someone cast a black person, say, as a character who's more usually portrayed as white? Well, I can see three main reasons. Uh, the first is a sort of colorblind. I hired whoever I thought was best for the job. Thing, you know, that's very no, boring. No, that's not how this works. It they hired them specifically to make a political point about race relations. That's obvious to everybody. 
Uh, next up is the socially conscious altruistic reason. You know, if someone thinks that increased minority representation is a good thing for society, then they cast minority actors increased in their Increased minority thing. representation in only white countries. What, what does that lead to, Sean? Things, how nice of them. Uh, the third is the cynical capitalist reason. You know, i.e., we want to market our film to black people, say, so we cast a famous black person in it to make it easier for us it, to do yeah, that. Yeah, it's funny how all these major capitalists share all of your social views, Sean. Do you ever think about that? Or maybe if you're especially cynical, you could try to use the debate and attention around a controversial casting choice as free marketing and then cast as to intentionally provoke one. I'm sure there's a fair amount of that going on behind the scenes in Hollywood. Now we're getting into the fascist rhetoric section of my video here, but the problem for Mark Collett and other fascists like him is that they need to elevate everything to the level of a civilization ending struggle. So much so that they completely miss the simpler and more pedestrian explanations for what they're seeing. You know, maybe a director hired a Chinese actor to be in their Hollywood movie, not because they want to undermine and destroy Western civilization, but because they want to market the this movie. This is extremely hypocritical. If it was the reverse, if a, if a director uh, casted a white uh, person to play a Chinese role, people like Sean would indeed act like it was a very uh, serious offense, uh, act of quote-unquote white supremacy, um, and it, I, don't, I don't really have the words for it, but it, accusing Mark of this is extremely disingenuous. All he's doing is taking your own logic and putting it back, putting it back to you. V in China. It's not as exciting, though, when you put it like that, is it? This escalation rhetoric is a central pillar of fascist argument. Everything is foreshadowing the imminent doom of civilization. And on the left, everything is uh, white supremacy. It is uh, cultural appropriation. It is genocide. You know, I feel like Sean should look in the mirror a little bit. So a cartoon for children with a black person in it? Well, that's a sign we're headed for destruction and death. It's why you never hear a fascist say, ah, oh, well, this is only a minor issue, this, you know, <laughs> this next point doesn't matter all that much or whatever, because for them, everything is turned up to 11 at all times. They do this because they're asking people to accept their extreme worldview and politics, and so they need an extreme threat to justify it, and lacking one, they just make no, one up. When out people are trying to be political activists, they try to sell what they are concerned about. Leftists do this all the time. Sean, you know that they do this. Um, Children's cartoons and old Doctor Who episodes and whatever else is lying around. The next trick I want to talk about is rather a big one. It's the trick of alluding to an apparent homogenous historical European identity. Let's look at Mark Collett's examples of things. This is going to be interesting. I'm pretty sure, I think most people would agree that, you know, historically Europe has been probably 99.99% white. Uh, you know, and he's gonna he's gonna bring up he's gonna, he's probably gonna bring up some like edge case examples of, like a few non-white people, and he's gonna say therefore, all of Europe was not homogenous. That's that's really just not how it works. Things that he's complaining about. Joan of Arc was a figure in the Hundred Years' War between the English and the French. The BBC cartoons were about the... Yes, the differences between the English and the French are the same as the differences between the English and Africans. Roman invasion of Britain. He shows the... Yeah, same for the British and the Romans. The difference there is exactly the same as the difference between the British and the Africans. Bayer tapestry, depicting the start of the Norman conquest of England. In fact, I would ask Sean, would you consider it cultural appropriation if the uh, actor from, say, Central Africa played uh, someone that was historically from South Africa? I don't think you would consider that appropriation. I think you would only consider it appropriation if someone that was clearly not black or actually 
you know, even if they were non-black but non-white, I think he might not even care about that. Um, so he, what he's doing is he's accusing Mark of being so fixated on race, but really, if you, if anybody steps back and they look at the rhetoric coming from the left the last 10 years or something, you know, they're, they are just as fixated on race, you know? He needs to, he really needs to look in the mirror and he needs to understand that these things are not happening in a vacuum. The rise of the, of uh, fascism, you know, that he's so concerned about is directly correlated with the increased racial uh, rhetoric coming from coming from the left. It's completely symmetrical. And let's, let's keep going with the video. He shows a painting of the battle of uh, wherever that was uh, between the French and the UK and allies. And most confusingly of all, he shows some Vikings from the TV show Vikings, I believe, when he's talking about the lands that our ancestors built. Mark, what are you talking about? European history is a history of conquest and division and warfare. When were we ever united or homogenous or monocultural? I mean, Britain, for instance, was invaded by... And right back at you, buddy. How, how can uh, white people culturally appropriate black culture if Africa is full of... Warfare, conflict, genocide, and violence, all rape, all these sort of things. You know, look, look, seriously, look in the mirror. Invaded in turn. Everyone, basically. When you say your ancestors, who do you mean, even? Which one of the various groups of people who invaded Britain are you talking about? If a black person, uh, you know, felt some kind of connection to uh, some kind of African historical event, Sean would not come in and, you know, say, oh, you were actually from West Africa, but this event happened in Eastern Africa, so how can you claim that you're associated with that? No, he would uh, congratulate them for feeling pride in their history and having a sense of identity. So don't, don't buy into his kind of deconstructionist sort of uh, disingenuous argument here. Of course, the reality here is that when Mark or other fascists like him say culture or identity or religion or ethnicity or nationality, they mean skin color. And it really is that simple. So when Sean or other leftists complain about cultural appropriation, they mean skin color as well. Britain and France fighting a series of wars over a hundred years. That really is monocultural and homogenous to them, because both territories were primarily white. Which is incredible. White fascists would rather be engaged in a bloody fight to the death against other white people than have to sit next to a black person on the bus. I genuinely believe that to be true. Skin colour really is everything here. Take, for instance, this painting. Now, Mark includes this in his video around 12 minutes in, as he's talking about how Europeans had homogenous communities, common traditions, common bonds, and a shared ancestry. Mark includes this painting in his video because everyone in it is white, which apparently proves their shared common bonds, ancestry, traditions, and so on. There is a common bond between white people in the world, especially compared to non-white people. It doesn't matter that there was interracial uh, conflicts. It doesn't matter. There is a shared bond. Everybody can see that. And you would easily see that for black people across the world or Asian people or Central American people. You would not try to deconstruct that identity. You only do it for white people. Why is that, Sean? On. However, by showing this painting, Mark betrays that he doesn't have a clue what he's talking about. This painting is a private view at the Royal Academy, 1881, by William Powell Frith. Uh, to briefly quote the artist talking about this painting in 1887, Beyond the desire of recording for posterity the aesthetic craze as regards dress, I wished to hit the folly of listening to self-elected critics in matters of taste, whether in dress or art. I therefore planned a group consisting of a well-known apostle of the beautiful, with a herd of eager worshippers surrounding him. That apostle of the beautiful there being Oscar Wilde. 
So then, this painting, which Mark Collett included to show a supposedly homogenous culture, is actually showcasing cultural divisions. No, there's just degrees of homogeneity. Okay, when looking at Europeans versus non-Europeans, the Europeans are homogenous relative to each other. But when you're looking at British people relative to other European cultures, only the British are homogenous to each other. That does not mean that all differences are the same. That does not mean the difference between a British person and a French person is the same as the difference between a British person and an African person. And Sean knows this. Viewers at the time would have been supposed to laugh at wild scroopies hanging on his every word. They would have been supposed to notice the contrast between the more traditional dress of the women in the centre of the painting and the aesthetic inspired dress of the other women. They would have noticed the group of men looking disapprovingly at Wilde and so on. And Wilde was of course Irish. And the Irish, as we all know, have always been treated as equals by the English, right? I'd like of to see Mark gonna throw in the the Irish were not white thing. Mark Collett explained to a group of Irish people about how they and the English have always shared a common culture. I'm sure that would go over well. My point here is that this painting, far from portraying a unified culture, actually shows a divided one, divided in terms of nationality, politics, art, fashion, and so on. And behind the scenes, sexuality, you know, Wild had sex with men and was imprisoned for it. I'd also like to note that we can see in this painting a portrait of the then recently deceased Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli, who was Jewish by birth. Given that fact, and that the other most prominent figure here is a flamboyant homosexual immigrant, I wouldn't have thought Mark Collett would have been a fan of this painting. This video had nothing to do with homosexuality or Jewish people. This is a total... I don't even know the, the right word for it. A red herring, I think. It has nothing to do with the argument. All around. Anyway, to wrap up here, by reducing the various peoples in Europe to nothing but their skin colors, and by coaching their followers to like, identify- Race is not just skin color, okay? That's that's the most- that's probably the most, like, identifiable, like, feature, but it, it really is a shared common ancestry. People- like, people of Europe are more similar you know, ancestrally, genetically, then uh, they are with people from other from Africa or Asia. That's that's a fact. Everybody knows this. Sean knows this, and he he's not going to address that directly, but he's going to kind of talk around it to make it seem like it's not the case, you know. But of course it is. Everybody knows that. Identify with being white and nothing else. And Mark one more thing, you know. Uh, it, well, these people they break things down to just like the color of your skin like oh you just you just hate like certain colors like oh you didn't like black markers as a kid you know it's like something juvenile like that you know it's not really about the color it's more about you know the it's about the similar ancestral, similar heritage, the similar, like, you know, it's like the the shape of your, fi the, the way you look, you know, you, people that look like you, you know, you're going to feel something, you know, everybody is going to feel something about that, you know, I mean, it's not, it's, it's, it's not just about like the color, the pigment, you know, it's, it's really a lot more than that. Collett and his fascist pals are the ones writing people out of their own histories. The actual historical truth is that yes, what we today call Europe has always been comprised of different peoples Not and ethnicities. Not even close to the extent that it is today, which is why everybody is so upset, which is why, which is what Sean is not going to address. You know, there's a difference between 0.05% of the population being non-white and 30% being non-white and there's a clear difference there and people have a right to be upset about that cities and cultures all by the way with different ideas of what race is european history is not white history nothing is that clear cut the word white means european it always has and when people think of it's in the same sense that the word black means African. You know, it's 
These are like synonyms. And just because you had like a handful of people that weren't like originally from Europe in Europe historically doesn't mean that the whole history of Europe can't be talked about as a white history. But and simple. And I'll end with a question to Mark Collett or any of his fans that may be watching. Is Spain European? Do the country of Spain and its inhabitants count as European? And does its history count as European history? To you, I'm asking, obviously. I mean, I know it's in Europe. I ask because for more than seven centuries, what we today call Spain was largely an Islamic territory conquered by the Arabs and Berbers in the Umayyad conquest of Hispania in the 700s. Now, seven centuries is a long time. That is centuries of Islamic history taking place in Europe. Right, right back there. at you, buddy. Is the history of Africa really black history? Because it was totally dominated by white people for centuries. You think about that. Rhetorical question, of course. I already know what they think about that. They think it doesn't count because they weren't white. Because when fascists lying about history say Europe, again, what they really mean is white people. Thanks a lot for watching, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, right. one We're done here.